So I'm really happy to introduce um, Dr. Marla Bergweger, who is a fellow Northwest G G Web I should say a fellow G Web colleague. Um, she is um, a professor from St. Louis University School of Social Work, and she's executive director of the Gateway Geriatric Education Center, which is another one of HRSA's GWEP centers. She is co-project director of the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Her scholarly work focuses on family caregiving, uh, non-pharmacologic interventions for persons with dementia, loneliness and social isolation and social work practice. And she has authored um, four books and over a hundred um, publications. And she's gonna talk to us today about a topic that she has great expertise in on addressing loneliness and social isolation through a circle of friends. Really looking forward to hearing your talk. Great, <clears throat> well, thank you, Barb. Um, I am just really honored uh, to, to be included in this series. The lineup looks great. Uh, it's a little scary to be the first one, um, but here we go. Um, and thank you. I, I really am uh, glad to be able to support um, my colleagues um, affiliated with one of the other. So let's, uh, don't need to reconnect my drive there. Um, so the topic of loneliness and social isolation, has, as I'm sure everyone knows, has experienced, heard patients talk about, has just been um, prevalent throughout all of the world, quite honestly, in, in the last year. But we're going to talk about it from perspective of maybe pre-pandemic, current pandemic, and later. So uh, with that, here are my disclosures, and that looks probably familiar with the HRSA funding. I do want to, to thank um, our colleagues in Finland who introduced us to the Circle of Friends intervention that I will be talking about, and to my, my St. Louis University colleague, Max Zabatsky, who does this work with me. So what we're going to do today over the next hour and then time for questions is um, I want to, to really share with you some of the, the prevalence um, issues related to age-related loneliness and social isolation. Talk about maybe what we're learning and, and we'll continue to learn from having lived through the pandemic. And then to talk about some strategies that can be uh, incorporated into an age-friendly primary care health system, which I know you're all familiar with because we all live, live this every day. Um, and then talk specifically about some assessment issues as well as intervention. Let's look first at prevalence issues. Um, as the quote here says, and I think this is just such a poignant quote, um, loneliness and social isolation in older adults is an epidemic in plain sight. And um, it, it is, it is indeed. Um, I do want to start with making a distinction between these two terms. They get used interchangeably um, in the literature sometimes, uh, and certainly just, I think, by, by society in general. Um, think of them as um, qualitative and quantitative. So loneliness is the, the qualitative kind of assessment that you do. It really comes down to being the discrepancy between the uh, actual relationships that you have and the expectations that you have for those social relationships. Um, it's a very subjective kind of feeling and looks very different from person to person. Social isolation, on the other hand, can be thought of more as a quantitative kind of experience. It's the actual number of human contacts that you have in a given period of time. Now, these do overlap, as you'll hear me talk about, um, but, but it really, both of these can look very different um, depending on the individual. What do we know about loneliness? Um, I do want to draw your attention in the upper left-hand corner of my screen um, is a book that just was published last year by Vivek Mur Murthy. Uh, and he is a former US Surgeon General and current member of Biden's COVID team. Um, and he declared in 2017 that loneliness was a global health epidemic. Um, and, and then he published this book last year, which by the way is excellent, I got it, uh, and I would recommend it if this is an area that you're interested in. Um, as you can see here, the, the, the issues around loneliness and social isolation are not new, um, and in fact have first, you know, were first studied back in the 60s, uh, but it's only been in recent years that we um, began to realize the significant impact. Um, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine put out a, a very timely 
uh, major report last year in February, I believe it came out, um, dubbing it as a major public health concern. And we know that it's um, more prevalent than ever among all ages, and that's pre-COVID. Uh, so COVID is, adds a whole new level of, of this. But in 18, uh, Cigna did a, a significant study of about 20,000 uh, adults of all ages. And you can see here from these numbers, about half uh, reported that they were sometimes or always lonely, 47% um, felt left out, and about 43% said their relationships were not meaningful. Um, 27 people, 27% 27 of people reported that they rarely or never felt as though people understood them or they felt close to um, people or they had people to talk to. Um, and you can read on down. The, the startling um, statistic, or at least I hope it's startling, it was to me, um, the Gen Z generation, the 18 to 22 year olds, um, and heavy social media users uh, do appear from the studies that have been done to be among the loneliest and the least healthy uh, members of, of our society. So looking now at specifically, what do we know about uh, loneliness in, in older adults? So those were more generic kind of uh, prevalent statistics that I just uh, shared with you. Um, it's important to remember that you can be lonely uh, when you're around people, but not necessarily lonely if you're alone. And there's an, an increasing amount of literature coming out about people who do live alone. But looking at it, the numbers really in terms of prevalence for older adults are all over the place. Uh, you can see here, I've, I just kind of cited uh, several different studies, um, everything from 26% um, likelihood of an earlier mortality due to loneliness to 57% experience moderate to severe loneliness um, with 28, 43%. I mean, numbers are kind of all over. Um, but generally, we think about this in terms of, um, you know, somewhere about a third possibly seems to kind of be the, the kind of happy medium of all of these different studies. And as I mentioned earlier, we do know that social isolation is linked to loneliness. So what are the risk factors? Um, being isolated, um, certainly from family and friends, which we all know and uh, have experienced in this past year, and then having few or no social activities. Um, living alone does place one at greater risk, although it isn't a guarantee, and being unmarried or unpartnered. Now looking at social isolation, we know it's linked to increased risk for dementia. More about that in a bit. Um, and we know that uh, socially isolated older adults um, do report that they feel greater amounts of stress, they um, have fewer uh, social resources, and they have impaired sleep. Um, so again, let's look at these risk factors. Um, they look very similar as, as the ones I just reported for loneliness, being unmarried or unpartnered, being male, um, having a lower education and lower income. Uh, we absolutely know that, and you'll hear me provide a little bit more evidence uh, specifically about health income outcomes in just a moment, but we know that um, loneliness and social isolation both cost um, Medicare in particular, as you can see here, approximately $6.5 billion a year because people who are lonely and socially isolated do tend to end up in the hospital more. They seek out health care more uh, because in part of the impact of chronic loneliness and social isolation on one's health and physical and mental health both. Um, looking a little bit more deeply into the issue of predictors, um, we, we know that living in a residential care facility does place one at higher risk. I'll uh, talk in, in just a moment about a, a, a particular study that was um, just frightening. Uh, but let's look now at the predictive factors. Um, and you can see there is a long list here, but you know everything from living in a rural community to functional status, that being unmarried, unpartnered, uh, being female, which may have to do with higher expectations for relationships potentially, um, lower income, lower education, um, and then losses and, and illness. But the four that routinely and consistently um, are statistically significant include depression, that living alone piece, um, and feeling poorly understood by others, and then members of the LGBTQ plus um, older adult community. These are stronger predictors, in fact, than health, functional status, or loss of a spouse. Um, the, I, I cannot say enough 
that the literature is exploding right now. Um, I signed up um, some oh, a couple of years ago now, probably for a um, the Google Scholar Alert on new articles in in specific topic areas, and I put. Uh, loneliness and social isolation. I get a daily email, and if it has less than 10 new articles that have been published, uh, it's a slow day. So I, I just picked some of them that I thought were probably most relevant that you may be seeing in the practices that, that you all are in. Um, just this week, um, the uh, Framingham uh, group, uh, the Heart Study, uh, looked at 28 180 older adults and found that persistent loneliness is in fact an independent risk factor. Let me see if I can move my, my box here for dementia and um, that intervening with someone who has persistent or chronic loneliness can in fact uh, trigger a resilient kind of response uh, and that can also then result in a lower risk for dementia. Come back, as I've said, and talk a little bit more about that. Um, during the pandemic specifically, um, it, it, this is not going to be, to be a surprise to anyone. Um, and I think most of us have experienced it ourselves or certainly in with our patients and clients uh, and family member, older family members in particular. But, you know, those of uh, who are, are living with restrictions, whether that's sheltering in place, uh, you know, can't go the usual places um, that they are used to doing, um, you know, experience higher levels of, of loneliness. Uh, and that does not seem to differ greatly based on age, gender, or employment status. Um, again, not surprisingly, there are correlations between depression and suicidal ideations. Uh, although I've not seen anything that says um, suicide attempts or successes uh, are, are more prevalent among older adults during COVID, but I just may not have seen anything related to that. Um, and loneliness during lockdowns, um, there's not really any difference in the risk factors, as you can see here, uh, which are the ones we've already talked about, but um, it's just that the prevalence is higher and people are experiencing it more extreme, extreme rates. Um, and then surprise, surprise, safety precautions uh, that we've all had to take for the past year certainly also uh, increase the risk. Um, just a, a quote here over on the left-hand side from uh, Vivek Murthy, who says, during my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease or diabetes, it was loneliness. And I think that's a, a very telling statement. So I found this wonderful infographic um, and it's, uh, there's a lot there. Um, it, it'd be nice to have it a, a little bit more concise, but I want to draw your attention um, because this is um, a startling fact um, that I don't think most of us had ever thought about before. The physical impact of social isolation is equivalent to the smoking of 15 cigarettes a day. Um, and that's something I think that we all can relate to. We all know how harmful it is to smoke, much less smoke 15 cigarettes a day. So we um, to, to equate that to the impact that being lonely and socially isolated can have, um, I think is, is pretty compelling. And um, I've included the uh, website address here if you are interested in getting this. It's got some really great information it would make a, a busy but good uh, infographic to share uh, in waiting rooms, for instance. Okay, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about the health impacts. So again, this is kind of just a, a big picture overview because the study, there are numerous, numerous studies and I picked sort of the most um, uh, compelling ones, I think. So increased blood pressure, depression, weight gain, smoking, substance abuse, alone time, uh, co-occurring co with frailty and increase, increases for mortality. Uh, I mentioned all about the, the 15 cigarettes a day. It is uh, Loneliness has also been shown to be more um, harmful for people than obesity. So again, I think those two facts, those are things that we are very familiar with in terms of the negative outcomes on health. So from the mental health perspective, uh, again, not surprising, stress and depression, um, but the one that um, is, is getting a lot of attention and has for some years, but in a smaller circle of people, but a lot of attention now is the issue of cognition. Uh, and we know that loneliness and social isolation are in fact a risk factor for all cause dementia uh, with a study that just came out this past year, 40% increased risk for cognitive impairment uh, if you are experiencing chronic um, 
loneliness or, and or social, social isolation. So healthcare services, I mentioned um, that people who are experiencing these things um, increase the number of uh, times that they seek out healthcare, over 12 primary care provider visits per year, typically 50% increase in emergency services, and some reason to think that, that institutionalization may occur earlier than necessary or if it needed to happen at all. Um, so Steve Cole at UCLA, uh, I think really kind of just makes such a, uh, an important statement here when he says loneliness acts as a fertilizer for other diseases. The biology of loneliness can accelerate the buildup of plaque in the arteries, help cancer cells grow, spread and promote inflammation in the brain, promote several different types of wear and tear on the body. And I just think these are probably outside the realm of what most of us, even, even those of us in, in the health and, and geriatric world um, that, that we'd really ever thought about. Holt Lundstad has, has done, um, she's one of the, the best known researchers in this area, and she and her team looked at 3.4 million people over a period of seven years, all of whom reported to be lonely and socially or socially isolated or lived alone. Um, and their increase for death, as you can see here, for those living alone was increased by 32%. 29% for the socially isolated and 26% for those experiencing loneliness. And, and she and the her team describe it as this, loneliness inflames the, the brain's white blood cells, making one feel irritable, uh, negative, fearful. The brain then misreads those social signals. Other people become threats to us and then that distorts our reality. And this obviously, as you can see depicted here, um, can become a vicious cycle. What have we learned from, from COVID? Um, Tim Carpenter, who runs the Engage organization, I believe it's in Los Angeles, um, said it's bigger than the physician. And, and he was absolutely right about that. It really does, um, to use a cliche, take a village uh, to identify it and to intervene with it. So uh, there is probably not a single thing on, on this particular slide that uh, would be news to any of us because we all probably experienced uh, some degree of loneliness and or social isolation in this past year. Uh, but we know, you know, we've, we've come to recognize that the that relationships are even more critically important than we probably thought they were. Uh, we know we needed to plan for our health, uh, pay attention to those needs and feelings. And, and most, not maybe most importantly, but certainly importantly, is that we need meaningful and stimulating activities to keep us uh, engaged with the world. And we've had to ad address issues related to our eating and our exercise and our sleep and, and being able to access healthcare providers. Um, and then of course, there's been the issue. We've learned so much and not all of it good about the issues related to technology, particularly for older adults. Um, we still have one of our partners here in the St. Louis area, over 75% of the older adults in their sort of service area do not have a computer or access to a computer or um, internet. And so I think we've we've really got to you know, address that issue. Um, the research coming out says stay at home orders increase loneliness. Um, and um, it's again, not a surprise to anyone. So what as primary care providers, what can we and all of you do? Um, I've studied, uh, I just saw it recently, although it's a 2019 study, looked at loneliness uh, as it was assessed in a primary care setting. They found about a 20% prevalence. But again, you see these recurring themes. It was higher for those patients who were unmarried or partnered, unemployed, lower income, and in poorer health and then higher number of primary care visits and ED visits and hospitalizations. So again, that just, I think, goes to, to add further evidence for what we've, I've already talked about. So as providers, what can we do? Well, we can treat those issues that can limit independence, which we know kind of can spiral into loneliness and social isolation, meaning chronic pain, sensory impairments, hearing and vision particularly, incontinence, malnutrition, oral health. I mean, the, the, the list of things that, that limit, as we all know, older adults' mobility and sense of independence can certainly also lead um, to loneliness and social isolation. Absolutely identifying uh, depression, other mood disorders, anxiety, uh, and cognitive deficits. Um, ideally, 
um, you know, having having someone have a comprehensive geriatric assessment um, is is ideal. That may not always be feasible, but certainly, um, you know, the research has shown that someone who does have a, a full comprehensive geriatric assessment is more likely to still be living at home six months after uh, the assessment. Um, asking people what they need, and I'll get back. I'm going to talk a little bit more about assessment in a minute, um, and then making sure that that you are clear and openly communicate if there is a caregiver involved, which oftentimes there may not be uh, for someone experiencing loneliness and social isolation um, and, and incorporating that person. And then doing more social prescribing, uh, which is a common practice in the UK, but um, no, I don't know that we, we necessarily label it in that way here, um, but making those appropriate community referrals and, off, and facilitating to the extent possible some, a warm handoff. Um, but that requires that we know um, what's, what's available in our communities. Um, asking the older adults to talk about the frequency and severity of both loneliness and social isolation, and trying to really understand kind of a little bit about what their, their life um, is engaged in and what they are engaged in in their lives. So promoting, um, you know, the, the issues around community, um, and it really does, it, it, we need to address this at multiple levels, not only on the individual patient level, but certainly at the, at the community level. Uh, we're a pretty age segregated um, society in general. And, um, you know, so there are a lot of things I think that, that we can do outside the scope of, of healthcare, certainly. Um, we do need to recognize that there is significant stigma attached uh, in having to admit um, to your provider or family, or even maybe possibly to yourself, that you are lonely or socially isolated. It, it suggests that there's a deficit in you uh, and there's something wrong with you. So I think we as professionals have to acknowledge that. We also have to recognize that people have a right to self-determination um, in terms of, of you know, getting engaged in any kind of an intervention. There's some reason to think that group interventions work better for people who are experiencing social isolation where more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, intervention addresses loneliness. Um, I, I think the jury's a bit still out on, on that one. Take note of the, the bubble sort of up in the left-hand corner. Really, I think if we can just ask the adult, what, what do you want, what do you need, and what are you ready for? Um, I think we can, we can get the conversation going. So um, I think we also have to, when we're talking about um, these issues, I think we have to think about this sort of re-entry period into this next post-pandemic phase, as, as we're calling it. Um, uh, there's a lot of anxiety about it. I have older family members um, who um, say every time I talk to them, they, they say they will never eat in a restaurant. I hope that's not true, uh, but um, I think that that is, um, you know, something that that's just very typical of, of the level of fear. So I think as providers and professionals, we have to just be patient um, and we have to allow people to it, it kind of feel that this is a normal reaction to the situation that we've been living in for the past year, and maybe consider more of a graduated re-entry um, and to establish some boundaries and some guidelines for themselves. But assess comfort level and the stress by you know, asking the questions that I've included here. You know, how, do, how do I balance this? Um, what, what happens if I get out and I'm uncomfortable? Um, and then revisiting um, the reentry plans on a, a regular and kind of frequent basis, I think will help to allay the anxiety that people are. So I want to, to shift gears a little bit here now and talk about um, issues of assessment and intervention. And if we have time, um, I have a, a case study that I wanted to, to share with you as well. So looking at um, an age-friendly health system. Um, the 4Ms, of course, that, that Barbara mentioned it at the beginning, and I'll, I've got a slide here coming up but that I'll kind of put some assessment tools within, within the cons, uh, construct of, of the 4Ms, but let's talk now just more generally about loneliness and social isolation. Pre-COVID, when I um, would, would give a, a presentation, 
on this, I would ask for a show of hands because we used to do those in person. Um, and I would ask for a show of hands of um, people whose physicians or healthcare providers had ever asked them about loneliness or social isolation. And I don't think I probably had more than a hand or two altogether ever go up. Um, and since COVID, I actually, I still have tried asking that question on, on, on Zoom presentations and at a few more are, are going up. So again, I think that there is um, so much awareness of it societally that, uh, that I think we're thinking about it more. And, and it's certainly been in, in the news. I do have a fear, however, and the, my fear is that after we're, we're back at whatever our next normal is going to be, that we're going to forget uh, because, you know, the majority of, of society will get back to their lives um, and we'll forget that this was an issue for older adults before and it's going to continue to be an issue. So I think let's look now at assessment issues. There's lots of ways to come at this. And there's, there's not necessarily a right way um, and certainly not an only way, but there is, um, there is a wrong way and that's to, to not ask at all. Uh, we know, absolutely, we know that loneliness and social isolation are greatly underassessed by those in the, in the healthcare um, and social service uh, field. We know that those it's not a typical question on an intake or, um, you know, in a in a rooming kind of situation coming into a facility or to a, an outpatient clinic. So there's there's two ways to approach it. You can use scales, standardized validated scales, and I have some of those to share. You can also just simply ask a single item question. Um, and to try to get at sort of a little bit more about what the person's life um, is. Interestingly, women uh, tend to respond better if you just ask the question, are you lonely? Whereas men will be more forthcoming if you give them a scale to fill out or you ask them questions from a scale. So just something to remember uh, as you're thinking about interacting with the patients and clients that you see. Uh, interestingly also, um, and this, these studies are a few years old, but I suspect they're probably not um, terribly, terribly inaccurate at this point. But all age groups tend to overestimate the prevalence of loneliness in older adults, except, of course, older adults. So I think that's um, interesting. So I mentioned uh, the four M's earlier. And as you know, mentation, what matters. Um, oh, I have a typo there. I just now saw that for the first time. <laughs> what matters twice. Um, so it's mentation, what matters, mobility, and medications. Uh, so uh, how, how might we go about doing this? And I'm, I'm going, the next several slides are, are going to be a series of different scales, some of which you probably are familiar with, others um, I suspect you may not have seen. But again, remember, there's not any one right way. Um, you can approach this qualitatively, uh, or, or certainly quantitatively. You can also kind of come at it from um, uh, the perspective of asking about mood in general, depression and anxiety, asking about social support, and then of course, physical health, which most of you are probably um, already doing anyway. So here is the Cadillac, if you will, of, of assessments. Um, and if uh, you, you were doing a research project on this specific topic, these two topics, uh, I would recommend most, if not all of, of, of these. Uh, but the realities in, in practice, they, they are not um, viable options to include, uh, unless of course you're already doing some of these, but looking certainly at cognition, uh, because we know that there are some treatable forms of cognitive impairment, uh, certainly depression uh, being one of them, diabetes, sleep apnea, for instance. Um, but we also know that people who experience this are at greater risk for, for cognitive impairment. So that's an important piece. Looking at depression and anxiety, um, we recommend the PHQ-2 as a screen and then the 9, uh, generalized anxiety, certainly social support, loneliness, specifically, and then mobility. And what I have, um, I actually have uh, each of these scales, which I'll go through really quickly because um, you probably are familiar with most of these. But this is my growing list of um, sample assessment one item questions. Uh, and, and as I've given talks, um, people make suggestions of things that they use or uh, think would, would be good questions. So if anyone has any, put them in the chat box and I'll add them to my list. But you can see these are uh, more, more, some of them are head on. Are you lonely? Um, 
or what do you think about loneliness to more sort of general conversational kinds of questions. Tell me about your daily life and routines, your life overall. Um, the one I really like um, that's a little bit in, more indirect is if you have good or exciting news, who would you call first? I think that could tell you a lot um, about an older adult's life. So the rapid cognitive screen is a shortened version of the St. Louis University mental status exam which is copyright free, validated uh, on four continents and uh, is available on our um, GEC website in, I think last time I checked 30 languages, um, but it does pick up mild cognitive impairment um, and is, um, is the shortened version of, of the much longer scale. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time, I'm happy to answer questions about any of these later or can share the slides as well. PHQ-2, I think most everyone is familiar with the two item uh, questions uh, that are simply used for screening. Um, and if uh, greater than two go on then to complete the PHQ-9. And um, again, I'm, I'm not going to talk you know, in, in depth about these. I think they're all valid. This is uh, copyright free as well. Um, generalized anxiety. Um, we have um, been using the Spitzer um, at all scale and uh, find it to be uh, good. It's, it's not terribly cumbersome. It's only seven items. And I think that's, that's the piece that, that you have to think about if you're going to use scales is the, the ease of admin and length of administration. The Love and Social Support Scale, this is actually the shortened version. It's six items. The original is much longer. Um, it's, it's good. Um, and uh, we, we use that in our, in our geriatric assessment clinic, but I think we um, actually now, uh, and I, the next slide I think is the one after this is the one that I, I think we're going to start adopting. The UCLA loneliness scale is kind of considered the gold standard. Uh, and there is a longer version, there's a short version, and then there's the three item version. And this one is well validated and well validated on older adults. So it's the one that you see most frequently used in, in the research literature. We created a, a shortened, very easy mnemonic uh, called the Alone Scale. If anyone's interested, we, we are in the process of validating it. If anyone would like to, to help us do that, please, please let me know. But uh, just using the mnemonic of alone, are you emotionally attractive to others as a friend? Are you lonely, outgoing friendly? Do you have uh, no friends and are you emotionally upset? So we are just highlighting that. This is a new scale. Um, it's kind of lengthy. Uh, but for research, uh, it, it may serve our purposes, really focuses on social connectedness as opposed to social support. It's really, it's the connection uh, that's so important. And then certainly to look at mobility, an, an important piece of all of this process. Now I want to spend um, the remainder of my time before, before our questions and answer period talking about interventions. And there are a number out there and there's some fun ones and there's some well-validated ones. Um, but I think that, that it's just important for us to think about um, the fact that one size really does not fit all. Not everyone's a group person. And the primary intervention I want to talk about is in fact a, a group intervention. I think that we have to think about these issues um, as Sandra edmonds Cruz says, uh, social isolation is a micro level consequence of a macro level social force. And um, that, that just through the work I've been doing for the last couple of years, this really, really rings true. And um, we, we, as I mentioned earlier, we are an age segregated society. And uh, that's, that's a macro level issue that has contributed in part to um, our, our older adults experiencing loneliness and social isolation. So thinking about what would the sort of ideal intervention look like? Well, it, it probably needs to incorporate physical activity and exercise of some sort, cognitive stimulation and facilitators or uh, uh, you know, therapists or uh, providers of whatever discipline you know, who, who understand um, if it's a group intervention, certainly understand older adults and group dynamics, but, but also um, how to bring people together. Um, my, my, my colleague, social work colleague uh, from Adelphi, Philip Rosario, uh, I, I made this great quote that I've included here. Uh, aging in place sometimes ends up with people aging in isolation. 
And that's, um, that's exactly what we see with so many older adults who live alone in, in the home they've been in for many years. How can we approach this? Well, I think we first have to acknowledge it's an issue. Uh, we have to um, be very proactive in terms of engaging people around this issue, but at the micro and macro levels, uh, we need to be reaching out. We need to find some kind of way to impact people and then sustain that. And that really cuts across, you know, kind of all strata in our society. And there are lots of different ways to come at this. There's not just one way. It can be very much of a public education campaign um, that the, they've done in the UK, uh, or it can be just, you know, at the senior center offering the circle of friends intervention that I'm going to share with you. So looking at if you're going to do a group intervention, uh, we've, we've got to make sure people are fit. They have to be able to acknowledge that they uh, are experiencing loneliness and social isolation, um, and they have to want to be there. Um, you, you don't want to force anyone um, into a group that's focused on addressing loneliness and social isolation if, if they don't want to be there. Um, this is one of my favorite interventions. Um, this is being done uh, in currently in Africa. And um, move this a bit. they um, created friendship benches and they placed the benches outside the primary care practice offices. They um, have trained uh, lay workers, healthcare workers, um, who they call grandmother healthcare providers, and they sit on the bench outside and um, they will uh, conduct at six 30 to 45 minute sessions. And this is for all ages, not just older adults. Um, and they've been doing this for, for several years now. Um, they began publishing on this um, in 2015 and 16. And the results have shown that depression decreased, um, patients were, were, liked the flexible approach, they liked the support structure, uh, it was an immediate service, They're treating 40,000 a year, and it was a low cost intervention with, with a pretty high impact. Uh, I mentioned the UK, and um, the UK um, has so taken the issue of loneliness and social isolation seriously that they created a ministry of loneliness um, uh, several years ago. And they are working very much at the macro level, you know, at the community organization level to, to be able to create awareness primarily, but also then um, various interventions. Um, so they've created the chat bench. Um, and these are not, as, as the ones you saw um, from the, the one I just showed you, the friendship benches, these are just, you know, chat benches so if, um, where people can sit down and, and are encouraged to engage with whoever might be sitting there. Um, the, uh, for UN World um, Elder Abuse Awareness Day in 19, um, the, the UK police departments actually launched this initiative. And um, I haven't seen anything on it recently, but, um, they um, they were the, the last I, I read. They did an annual report. They do an annual report, and the last one I read is that that their initiatives were going very well. There's certainly befriending services. Uh, there's technology. We're of course starting to see a lot more use of technology in the home. Uh, and robots uh, are far more prevalent outside the U.S. Um, as a way to support older adults aging in place than than they are in in our country. Um, but befriending services have been around forever. Um, the, these have uh, we're just calling them. We're we're formalizing them and studying them now. But they can uh, be delivered in person or by phone or by Zoom, uh, we've seen a real proliferation of them uh, during COVID with college, high school and college students uh, being paired up with older adults um, and, and phoning once or more times a week. And the, the results that I've seen in the literature coming out on that are, are actually very positive. So these are, are, are formal, informal formalized relationships typically and can take on any number of kind of different forms and hopefully um, some, some uh, creativity uh, comes out as well as some sustaining. I actually, my very first uh, uh, social work class that I took as an undergraduate, I, I didn't know that's what it was called at the time, but I was adopted by an, an older uh, woman and I sort of a mutual adoption. And I went to visit her every week. She was um, 
uh, disabled and couldn't leave her apartment really. And um, I went to visit her. I didn't know I was doing a befriending service. Um, there's an interesting increase in the co-living arrangements. Um, as you recall from the Golden Girls, they had this figured out 20 years ago. Uh, but but the, the co-living arrangements aren't for everyone. Absolutely not for everyone. Uh, but they certainly do uh, address issues or can address issues around loneliness and social isolation. Um, but they can also help uh, financially as, as well as from, uh, from a healthcare perspective as well. The photo on the bottom here is actually a, a uh, program here in the St. Louis area, and I know it's um, not unique to St. Louis by any means, but it's where uh, young adults, primarily college-age students, uh, are living with persons who have disabilities or are older adults um, to provide companionship as well as, as practical support. Oh, housing has taken on another kind of um, turn, and that is uh, people who are moving into communities, sort of more communal, like uh, could be intergenerational, could be just older adults, but creates a, a community or a village kind of environment. Again, not for everyone, and most of them actually are fairly expensive, um, so are really not even accessible to maybe everyone who would like to do that. Um, there are benefits. Some are very informally structured. Others are are far more um, self-governed and, and have a governance structure. Um, some require time commitments, um, significant financial commitments. Um, and um, again, as I said, isn't for everyone. Two, two uh, social work colleagues have written a book. Uh, they toured a number of the co-housing communities throughout. Uh, and there's a significant number of them on the West Coast uh, as opposed to the rest of the country, particularly the Midwest. I, I will wrap up here my last few minutes um, by sharing with you an intervention that we've been engaged in for the last couple of years that was developed um, by um, colleagues in uh, Finland uh, nearly 20 years ago. They've been, been publishing on, on their work for about 20 years now. And it's called Circle of Friends. Um, it is uh, a group intervention um, it was developed at uh, Helsinki University and is really grounded in the idea of a group rehabilitation kind of model. It is specifically for older adults who uh, are experiencing loneliness and or social isolation. And its sole purpose is to alleviate and prevent loneliness. It is not a clinical intervention in, in the way we think uh, typically of clinical interventions. Um, it is, uh, and in fact, I'll share with you a story in a moment uh, about some of our experiences here in the St. Louis area with some pioneers in Circle of Friends. And um, we have one partner that all of the groups are lay led uh, by members of the, the, the community. So the, the group meets eight, a group of eight, I'm sorry, um, or so eight's a kind of an ideal number, but it could be less, it can be more, meet uh, 12 times over a three month period, so weekly. And the purpose of the group is to make new friends, um, eradicate loneliness, um, and also to share that there's, there's three unique features of this intervention um, that I find very appealing uh, it's from, a, from a group uh, intervention perspective, and I'll, I'll share those as, as I go along. But um, there's a reflection component to this that, that you don't find in, in most kind of support. Um, as I mentioned, the group who have been uh, very generous with us, um, sharing their time, sharing their resources with us, and giving us um, permission to adapt. And um, the, the Circle of Friends intervention here in the in the U.S. and to um, you know certainly contribute to the fund of knowledge that that is is growing on the issue of, of loneliness. They've they've been very gracious uh, with their support. And um, so they've been studying this, as I said, for about 20 years. And uh, their first the couple of studies in particular uh, that I want to point out is they, they did a randomized control trial of uh, 235 older adults, 75 and older, which is an interesting point to make. Their, uh, their sort of cutoff on the low end of the age that they deem appropriate, uh, which is one of the adaptations we had to make here in the US, is 75 and older. Um, and obviously we have, we don't live as long apparently as, as those in Finland. So we've um, lowered that to 65, but you can see it two years post-intervention, 97% were still living. Um, 
And they had a very, very impressive dropout rate of only 2.5%. About 40% of their groups continued meeting, which is the second really interesting and unique feature of this is they, the first 12 sessions are facilitator led, but uh, at the end of that period, the groups are supposed to go out on their own and the facilitator uh, is out of a job, essentially. Um, they also found that uh, cognition was improved and then another study that they did of a uh, smaller, about half that size group, um, found that 95% reported they were no longer lonely, big range, 45 to 85%, so they made new friends, and again, about 40% uh, continued meeting. But the important piece of this is, in this whole, whole topic, is that um, people feel needed. And, and that's the stimulation, that's the connection that they're making. And that's, I think, a large part of what these groups provide. Um, they've done um, some long-term follow-up. Uh, at 10 years, 67% of the groups continued to meet um, compared with 40% initially. 87% uh, were still saying they were no longer lonely. 75% um, reported finding new friends. So I think the evidence is there. Um, and we are, we're certainly trying to replicate that. We are, uh, we've got three partners uh, in, in our, our, our GWEP has, has three partners and we are collecting data probably as we speak. So why does this work? Um, it's very positive. It's a really good feel good um, kind of in, intervention. Um, it's, it's got these three unique features that I mentioned, which are that the, the groups uh, continue on their own. Ideally, there's a reflection piece. Um, and probably the most unique feature of this is it is not a curriculum-based intervention, meaning there is not a specific protocol for every session. I'm going to talk about the components and the themes, but the, the specific topics and activities uh, are generated from the group members themselves. The facilitator organizes them initially, but the ideas come. So every, you've seen one circle of friends group, you've seen one circle of friends group. Um, each group will look different. And our partners um, in the St. Louis, our two primary partners, um, their groups look completely different. Uh, one group, and some of them are, are pictured here, um, are, are living in um, public housing in the senior buildings. And our other partner organization uh, serves an exclusively older adult population, all of whom have uh, developmental or intellectual disabilities. So it, we've told them, you know your populations and adapt your groups to, to fit the needs of, of the communities that you serve. Um, how does it work um, a little bit more in depth? If you think about this, um, this should sort of, sort of be a, a 3D sort of swirling model in, in my mind. The goal is that people feel a sense of awareness, mastery, um, and that they're, they're not feeling uh, needed any longer, that they are having more positive than negative feelings. Um, and, and the psychosocial group rehabilitation kind of concept uh, bringing people together with this common issue, helping them to contribute and, and then to be able to bond with these, these other members to go out on their own is, is the ultimate goal uh, for this. So the three components that I mentioned earlier include um, art and inspiring activities, um, group exercise or a health theme discussion and therapeutic writing and sharing. Um, and ideally, and we have had to make an adaptation for, for virtual, which we started doing last summer, uh, we cannot squeeze these all in because uh, we've had to reduce our virtual groups to one hour and um, we just can't fit all these in. So we've kind of broken them up and, and offer them in uh, cycles, but we still get over the 12 weeks, we still address all three of these issues. And um, I tell, when we do the training, I, I tell potential facilitators that you're only limited by your own um, creativity. And, and I think that there's just many, many different ways to come at it. So art um, and inspiring activities, again, the ideas come from the members. So as we do, we've developed a pre-assessment process where we do pretty extensive interest, hobby, former employment, family, travel kind of assessment with people. Um, 
we are uh, on campus group is through our SLU Aging and Memory Clinic and the groups are all run by graduate students in medical family therapy or social work. And you know, one of the things that they did virtually this, this winter was they took the group on a virtual tour of the Louvre. Uh, and then they did some virtual tours of some places in St. Louis. Um, so it's been um, it's been really an interesting exercise and a learning curve for, for transitioning all of this from an in-person group to, to virtual. Group exercise can be anything from outings uh, to chair yoga. Uh, we had someone come in and, and do breathing exercises um, with people. There can be uh, dancing. There, it, you're really limited, again, only by creativity and by what the group members, you know, are interested in doing and can safely do. Um, then the therapeutic writing and sharing. Um, the, the group in Finland recommends that people journal and then bring their journals and discuss them or write during the group itself. Um, we've had some groups that weren't too keen on the whole writing thing. So we've kind of, again, adapted um, that to, you know, maybe just putting out some discussion questions and talking. But I've been so impressed with the depth of uh, the, the discussions that some of the groups have had. And, and uh, one group actually decided to create life books as a way to share their reflections and uh, really were able to dig very, very deeply into their lives and, and to share some not only wonderful memories, but also some really painful experiences and that led to their uh, feeling lonely and socially isolated. So uh, again, this is part of the, the bonding process. So who is appropriate? Uh, as I said, we, we lowered um, the, to 65, uh, subjective feelings of being lonely or socially isolated, uh, willingness to participate, and certainly for telehealth, you have to address the whole access and uh, technology literacy issue. Having um, being able to have vision, hearing, and or mobility that allows for participation. Um, but then um, the, this is not an intervention for persons with cognitive impairment, but certainly someone in the early stages or someone who has MCI could, uh, could, could participate as well. And by the way, uh, we have one group that participated through our on-campus clinic uh, virtually, uh, sort of, uh, all from landlines. Uh, so it does not have to be high tech necessarily. Um, this is just a sample. Uh, we have created a manual because the one in Finland is in Finnish. Uh, so we, we have uh, created it and we've offered some strategies and some ideas, examples for activities, that kind of thing. Uh, but again, we, the idea is that those come, come from the group members themselves. Um, just real quickly here, uh, we have had some, some steep learning as I'm sure everyone has in, in transitioning to virtual delivery, delivery, excuse me. Um, but we, um, we found that if we have a session zero, as we, we call it, uh, where it's a one-on-one, -on -one, maybe starts out by phone and then eventually gets to, to a Zoom meeting, um, that that has certainly helped uh, a great deal. Uh, we've also learned a lot about uh, group facilitation online. Uh, it's a little harder to, to read you know, social cues. And so we've had to really work with the facilitators, uh, particularly our graduate students, um, you know, in terms of kind of how to manage group, which is, that's a, a part, whether it's an in-person or virtual, but it, it has some unique challenges, I think, in the, in the virtual environment. Um, and then certainly to be on the, on the lookout for someone who's experiencing uh, depression or anxiety or other issues that maybe need to have referrals uh, or further assessment. Uh, and then uh, we've, of course, had the issue of people who didn't want to be on a camera uh, or did want to be. We had woman, one person who somehow uh, they finally got it worked out, but she was always sideways because of some, some setting in, in her computer. So, you know, it's, it's been quite an adventure to transition to, um, to a telehealth delivery, but um, we, we persevered. And our partners in the community actually are using devices. We use Zoom. Um, exclusively. So they're using, uh, they, they, we've, we have a, a grant, besides our GWIP grant, we have a, a grant from a local foundation uh, that enabled us, the three organizations, to go together. And our other two have per used their funds to purchase devices and wireless plans for their people. Uh, I don't 
think I, just real quickly here, um, because I, I know we're just coming up on, on time for questions and answers. So, so we had, um, uh, this is mostly simulated based on, a, on an actual uh, participant in one of our groups, but she really was struggling uh, with the technology piece of it. And um, the son came over and he got frustrated. She was frustrated. Uh, and he said, I can't do this. I can't leave work every time. Um, so if we had the luxury of time, I, I would get your thoughts on how, how might we continue. Uh, and what we did uh, in this case is we worked with her, um, into the students actually worked with her individually to, to improve her, her comfort level uh, with the technology. And I'm happy to report it got better. So um, just wrapping up, what do we need to do? At the community level, we just need to increase awareness and that's what you're doing right now. Uh, we need multiple uh, multifaceted approaches to how to address this. Um, and we need um, to have more, more research. We need to know what kind of uh, interventions are best. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that there's some school of thought about, you know, one kind of intervention for loneliness, one for social isolation. I don't, we need to, to test that. And we also need to, to know, know much more about the impact of technology and whether that helps or hurts. Um, on the uh, individual level, I've sort of already ventured into that area, but um, we, we certainly do need um, to, to have more multifaceted uh, interventions within themselves. So we need interventions like circle of friends that include, um, you know, cognitive uh, and social engagement and stimulation, as well as uh, reflection and discussion, as well as health and exercise related. Takeaways. Um, we know that older adults um, need to feel safe and they need to feel like this a group or, or at least even addressing this is, is something safe to do. We all need to be doing a better job of assessing. Uh, we need to know what's out there in the community or create it if we can. Uh, we just uh, trained a number of people in the Kansas City area and they formed a Circle of Friends hub now and are getting ready to start groups there. Um, and we need to make sure that we as a society don't forget about this after the pandemic is over in whatever form that looks like. Uh, oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, I've listed here that I'm happy to share the slides, as I said, uh, a number of resources, um, uh, many of the, the articles by the, the group that founded it. And um, I put together kind of, I think, 11 uh, different articles that they've published and they're, um, they just had a new one today or th this month. So um, at, the, at our gateway GWEP, uh, we just a couple of things to mention that we have coming up. We have our 32nd summer uh, annual uh, geriatric institute, which will include a circle of friends training as two breakout workshops that will be a full afternoon. We are fully online again this year and uh, would welcome any of you to, to join us. Uh, we also provide training for a non-pharmacologic intervention for older adults uh, experiencing dementia called cognitive stimulation therapy. We were designated, our GWEP was designated as a North America CST training center. Uh, and then we are joining with two other GWEPs, Wyoming and South Dakota, um, to uh, co-sponsor the second annual dementia webinar on Wednesday, uh, June 15th. Uh, and you can find out information about all of that on our website. And I am done at two minutes past. <laughs> How did I do, Barbara, on time? Oh, you did great. You actually had plenty of time. You could have gone for a little bit longer, but um, this was great. And I really am excited about the Circle of Friends intervention. That's um, and, well, and, and because we're a federally funded um, entity like you all, um, you know, we are at this point able to provide the training for free and we have we've done it virtually now several times. So if anyone is interested, please, please don't hesitate. Here's my my uh, email address. Reach out and I would be happy to, to chat with you about that. Great. Well, we do have a question. You had talked about who is appropriate for Circle of Friends and Barbara Green was wondering about how you actually go through the screening um, um, for these so, considerations. So our, our, I'll share with, with three partners. Um, so at, um, at the Public Housing Authority, uh, they 
they have X number of what they call senior buildings, all older adults. And so what they did is, um, I thought this was just brilliant. Um, the social worker actually identified the leaders first and then, um, and they're all residents of the buildings. It was, it happens to be five older women who live there. And they, um, they kind of then did a, uh, not quite door to door, but they sort of identified people that they, you know, were concerned about. And so they did more of a kind of targeted uh, intervention. And um, then our, our partners with um, the Association for Aging and Developmental Disabilities, they again, they have a smaller uh, client population and they, they knew, they knew who they were worried about. What we did at the university is we kind of just did the you know, build it and they will come kind of approach where we, you know, got word out. We had flyers and we did emails and we gave talks. So we get referrals from geriatricians and some primary care from some geriatric psych people from, uh, you know, we've, we've had the, been able to do some media kind of things. So we get referrals from family members. Um, so we get, we get our referrals and um, then we have a, a a pretty lengthy, at least an hour long kind of intake, if you will, or pre-assessment. Sometimes that includes some technology uh, now, but um, we do, we administer several of the, of the measures that I talked about. We also um, do this interest um, kind of assessment where we, I mentioned it earlier, um, but we really just, the, the person doing the pre-assessment really just spends time and gets to know the person and makes sure that they understand what kind of group this is and that the group entails talking about being lonely. And so not all the time, uh, but you know, it's, it's something that, that they need to, to feel okay about, you know, and that the space should be safe enough that they feel okay to do that. I don't know Bart, if that answered the question. Yeah, well, and then another part to that is, um, do um, people ever self-identify to yes, come in? they do. And we have actually gotten, um, not many, not many, um, but we have actually gotten a, a, a couple, I think, who have heard about us um, and um, our partners in the, in the housing authority, uh, what they ended up doing is they, they made buttons that said, ask me about my circle of friends. And so people wear them around. And so they, they've actually gotten some self-referrals because people are like, well, what is this about? I want to know about this. Um, and so I thought that was a really creative strategy as well. Interesting. Um, I'm assuming you have um, some sort of a an additional referral list for people who are not appropriate for this that you are able to. Uh, yes, that's a good question. Thanks for for asking that one. Um, the the St. Louis University Aging and Memory Clinic is in the Medical Family Therapy Department, which has its own clinic, and um, it's a. a counseling center um, staffed by doctoral students and, and faculty members. And um, so we're able to refer there, but we have also um, identified uh, clinicians in the community uh, who, are, who specialize in working with older adults, particularly around depression, anxiety, loss, and grief. And so, yes, we do have. And so we, um, we my colleague Max and I meet with the graduate students weekly um, and, and we are able to discuss when, when referrals need to be made. But yes, that's, a, that's an imperative, I think. And then Claudine Wallace, and hi Claudine, is wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the transition process from a facilitated group to the group running <laughs> itself, and does the group continue to be connected to the facilitator in some way? Um, the, the, <laughs> The easy answer is every, every group that has sort of gone through this transition has done it differently. So um, I, I suspect that, that our, our friends in Finland probably have a, a, a much probably clearer, more structured way of it happening, but we're still new enough at this that it's, it's kind of happens how it happens. Uh, we have the, the, remember the group that I mentioned that, that was all calling in from landlines? Um, and uh, they, they were calling into a Zoom number on, on landlines. They still call in every Monday and the students transitioned out in December. Uh, but the student knows they're still calling in because he gets an email that says, oh, so-and-so's joined your, your, your group. Um, so, uh, and we probably have not, oh, I don't even know if we're at 40% of groups that have really continued on their own. We're finishing up a group right now that we 
it looks quite quite likely that they'll continue on. But mostly what we do is we try to make sure we introduce it uh, early on, that everybody understands that's, that's the plan. Um, and then, you know, continuing maybe kind of ramping up the discussion as it gets closer and closer to that 12 weeks. Uh, and then, and then really the starting to talk about, okay, how is this going to happen? You know, will you do, you know, a, a phone conferencing? Do you, do you want to use Zoom? And this is like with our clinic groups. Uh, do you want to, you know, if you want to use Zoom, does everybody feel comfortable doing that? You know, should we do some practice sessions to make sure you're comfortable with that? Um, and then pre-COVID, um, some of the groups that we're going to continue on, uh, they were going to make plans to go out to eat once a month, for instance. Um, that's how they were going to transition to self-sustaining. Where That's probably the part I think that we, we need to really, um, we, we need more time and experience, I think, to sort of figure out the best way to, to do that. Um, and um, wondering about um, where are these sessions provided when we're not all virtual? Um, do, you, do you provide them at the center and the different places like in Finland, are they providing them in different settings? Yes, um, by the way, the groups in Finland are full days. Wow. Um, and that was a, probably the, the, the biggest adaptation we had to make because you know they're just, um, we, we couldn't think of any organizations that have the resources, you know, really to be able to, to do that uh, for a full day. Uh, so we've, we've had to, of course, shorten that. I mean, if anyone would like to do a full day, that'd be wonderful. But yes, they were happening uh, in senior centers. Uh, they were happening in community rooms, in the senior buildings uh, through, through one of our partners. I know some of the groups uh, that we've talked to her getting started. Uh, one group was actually going to start in a in an, uh, skilled nursing facility. And I think um, that would be an ideal location. There was a study and I, I uh, thought I had it on a slide, I didn't. Um, there was a study that just came out uh, this past summer of um, looking at one specific nursing facility and 100% of the people said they were lonely. Not socially isolated, but they were lonely. And 75% of those were severely lonely. So I think there's absolutely, um, you know, a place in any residential facility. So yeah, I think you can use community rooms, public libraries. I know ours here, and I'm sure this is the same everywhere, um, have community rooms, and they would love to have people uh, meet that. You know, interestingly, one of the things that we found is that, you know, and I, anybody in aging services knows this, transportation can be really challenging. Uh, you know, when you're trying to get older adults to in-person groups. And we've kind of eliminated that, you know, with the virtual groups, but it's a trade-off, obviously. So I think as, you know, as we are able to get back into in-person, we will hold them, our campus ones will hold those in, in uh, our clinic space. Um, and then our, I think our partners are going to are going to go back to one group was doing senior centers and the other was doing the community rooms at their at the housing authority, but it's really just, you need a space and there's not a lot of equipment. This is a really low cost intervention in many ways. Mm -hmm. So Janet Pohl is wondering um, about the Circle of Friends program also, a lot of interest. Um, oh, and she's wondering how it's sustainability addressed. Uh, in terms of the group continuing on afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're still new enough at this, having only been at this for a couple of years now, uh, we've not we're, we're not there yet on that one. But in talking to um, the the group in Finland and reading, you know, the the, uh, the studies that they've published, uh, they continued to have some contact uh, with people, although the facilitators were not there. Now, one of the things that they do talk about is, you know, maybe if, if the group started out in um, a community organization or, or some space in a healthcare facility, uh, being able to, you know, if you can continue to provide that space and maybe some supplies or support for the group, then the group can just meet without the facilitator. I think that's, that's sort of the ideal uh, scenario for, for being able to get the group to sustain. Virtually, it's easy 
if everybody's comfortable, you know, if you, you have to have one person who says, yes, I'll set up the Zoom or I'll set up the conference call uh, and every, and, you know, I'll email everybody. So you, there's got to be a, some reasonable level of, of technology literacy. Mm -hmm. And then um, another question that Janet was asking is if there's a social skills element built into the program, maybe for the future? There certainly could be. Absolutely. I think, and I guess it, partly depends on how you define social skills. Um, and so that's one piece of it. I think the other piece would be, uh, what do the group members want? Um, you know, do, do, if, if, is the group going to, to cohese enough that, that they feel comfortable saying that they need social skills and that you could, could address those things? Um, I think it, yes, absolutely, there'd be no question. Because, you know, it's for some older adults, they have become lonely as older adults, but there's a whole nother segment of the population who've always been lonely mm -hmm. and maybe who always have, you know, kind of not felt connected. So you really, you have two groups and they may have different needs in terms of social skills. Mm -hmm. And um, are you measuring outcomes after the intervention in some way? Yes, we are doing um, with our two partners that I've talked a lot about. Um, we are doing um, pre and post, and we're looking at loneliness, social isolation, quality of life, uh, and depression. Um, and I actually had a question. Um, I'm just curious. Um, the focus of the intervention is loneliness, but you're also measuring social isolation. So are you evaluating social isolation when you're screening people as well? Yes, that's part of our pre-assessment process. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I, must, might, I might have missed that. Okay, and then Linda is wondering, um, she says, um, did I hear you say earlier that the screening tool is not copyrighted and if so, can it be shared and used? So some of those tools are not copyrighted. Um, we, uh, my, my colleague, John Morley, uh, loves to create measures and has been very uh, productive over his, his decades of, of um, time as a, as a geriatrician. And he is a staunch believer in never copywriting because then you don't charge for it. Um, and so, yes, the, the tools that were developed at St. Louis University are all copyright free. And we actually created a, um, a tool that we use to assess the four M's. It's called the Rapid Geriatric Assessment and includes the Rapid Cognitive Screen, which you saw, the SARC-F for sarcopenia muscle weakness, and then the other two items, the other two in, the, in that battery. And these are all on our website. We have a training manual. We have um, a uh, training video. The other two uh, measure anorexia and, and frailty. Um, and so we use that as the basis for our age-friendly initiative. Excellent, well, how nice. Um, I don't see any other questions other than there's an awful lot of nice comments um, oh. for this presentation and I'll send those along to you um, later, but this was just a great way to start off our spring series. Oh, and, thank um, you. Um, I I don't know if it's a good one. As I said, I'm not sure if it's good to be at the beginning or the end, but um, I, I, if you think it's got was a good start, I, I'm that was absolutely and it's so nice to see you again. <laughs> it's good to see you and thank you and um, you all have my email. And yep, in fact, Linda says you'll be getting lots of emails for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you and en enjoy the rest of your week. And same to you and everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye bye.